Hello and welcome to the second lightning lunch of the 2021-2022 academic year hosted by the Critical D Digital Humanities Initiative and the Digital Humanities Network at the University of Toronto. My name is Dr. Elisa Tersini, and I am the Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute and the Critical Digital Humanities Initiative at the University of Toronto, and I'll be facilitating our discussion today. We are very lucky to be joined by three wonderful speakers talking about three very different mapping projects spanning time and place. Our first speaker is Dr. Bhavani Rahman, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Historical and Cultural Studies at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Her interests include South Asian history and histories of empires, colonialisms, and indigeneity. Her GIS project, Decolonial Decolonializing Archives of Water, Data Justice, and Critical Cartography for a Postcolonial City was funded by the CDHI's Emerging Projects Grant. Our second speaker, Marcel Fortin, is the head of Map and Data Library at University of Toronto Libraries. He has been working with maps, GIS, and data since the 1990s. He has a particular interest in historical GIS having co-edited the volume Historical GIS Research in Canada in 2014. He is also involved in a number of historical GIS projects that deal with land settlement in Ontario, the history of drinking and alcohol, Indigenous history, and Toronto's lost rivers and streams. And our third speaker is Tia Sager, a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History and one of the inaugural CDHI graduate student fellows. Her dissertation projects uh, her dissertation project, The po Poetics and Politics of Space, a regional analysis of the Crete and post-palatial built environment, considers the social and political dimension of the built environment on the island of Crete during the late Bronze Age by means of space syntax analysis, 3D scanning and modeling, and phenomeno phenomenological approaches. So with that, I will turn it over to Bhavani. Uh, Elisa, thank you so much. Uh, I think you need to make me co-host. Bhavani, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There's a bit of a lag. Yeah, okay. So I need to be made co-host, I think, so that I can share my uh, PowerPoint, if that's possible. I think you are already a co-host, Bhavani. Okay. Are you able to share? Yeah, thank you so much. While the screen um, pulls up, I should also clarify that I'm not a scholar of indigeneity. What I am is a scholar of colonial, uh, colonialism and property in South India and a scholar of colonial bureaucracy and the governance of property. So um, with that, let me also say that uh, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to present my work. Um, my previous work, um, as I explained, which is on um, property and sort of history of colonial governance, uh, kind of brought me in a very uh, haphazard way to the uh, question of water and hydrocolonialism uh, in Chennai, which is the city I uh, primarily uh, research on and whose archives I know uh, relatively well. Um, and so it's been quite an interesting journey kind of to think about space, to think about digital technology, and I've been very grateful for the support of uh, all the members of CDHI um, and Marcel actually, who um, have helped me so much to move this project along. Um, I thought what I would do is uh, very quickly take you through um, my slideshow um, and explain why I decided to use uh, digital technology and tools for my research and some of the challenges um, and opportunities that this um, uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, critical digital tools have helped, you know, some, some of these as I've encountered them in my research so far. So with that, let me begin. So this is a Google map of Chennai, which just marks you, marks, allows you to place Chennai um, uh, in the world. It's a city in South India. Uh, it was established by the East India Company, so it's a colonial uh, city. Uh, many of its infrastructures, especially its water infrastructure, owe to Imperial uh, British um, hydro engineering from the 18th and the 19th centuries. You can also see that it's on the, on the coasts of the Bay of Bengal, 
which is uh, part of the Indian Ocean and is shared by India, uh, shared in the sense all the different literal uh, nations um, that are on its shores include Myanmar, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, Indonesia. This is a map of um, uh, uh, storm uh, patterns from the 1940s made by a wonderful uh, architectural uh, historian and landscape uh, theorist, Lindsay Bremer um, in the UK. Um, and what this map allows us to see is the city of Chennai is uh, on the path of severe uh, cyclonic storms, especially in the Northeast monsoon, just as now, um, almost um, not as much as say Bangladesh, but you can see the density is quite, quite high. Um, as a result, Chennai's water hydrology is, as I said, monsoonal, it's rain fed and it's highly seasonal. Uh, these are two images just to give you a sense of um, what Chennai is, which is that it's a city that is prone to severe flooding and severe drought. So on the left is an image from the 2015 floods. Um, on the right is an image from uh, the 2019 uh, water scarcity, the drought, which basically drained all of Chennai's water reservoirs. And I put 2021 back on the, on the left so to show you that the floods have visited the city again this week um, has been quite bad for the citizens of Chennai. Um, this slide is a way for me to explain how contemporary efforts to uh, deal with this problem of water seasonality um, is in a way um, quite indebted to the practices of hydrocolonialism, right? Or to the practices that were put in by the colonial hydro engineers um, in Chennai in the, from the, in the 19th century. Um, part of this has involved uh, today, for example, uh, a desire to restore uh, Chennai's water bodies to their kind of original pristine uh, nature. Uh, a lot of it involves dredging um, um, and you know, drainage management. Uh, legally and politically, it has entailed today's uh, environmental um, measures entail eviction and resettlement of Chennai's urban poor. Um, there has been a, some amount of understanding of gray water and rainwater harvesting, desalination. So what you're basically seeing is a kind of conservational sort of um, impetus alongside a kind of clearing impetus. So both to conserve water and to enable its flow. Um, and these are sort of very much tied up with a nostalgia for a time when Chennai was imagined or a nostalgia for a time when people believed that Chennai had a plentitude of water and everything was in some kind of equilibrium. Obviously that is not the case um, as I found in my uh, research. So what became important to me as I began to research this problem was the need to re-describe relations between water and land in an urban city, uh, bring to the fore the idea of the right to, to the city um, and in fact do as much as possible through scholarly scaffolding that would allow us to get some kind of critical purchase uh, on not just hydroengineering, but this kind of problem of eviction and resettlement as the primary solution to all of uh, uh, urban infrastructure problems. Um, I became quite interested in the depiction and the re and understanding of the water cycle around the question of wetness rather than land and water, and around this question of seasonality rather than plentitude and scarcity. Um, but what really brought me to maps was I realized when I was doing my research that uh, maps were really, really important in the contemporary struggle around the city. So what you see here is an image from a public hearing I attended in 2019, where the eco restoration body is offering its uh, expertise, uh, a depiction of various uh, canal structures in the city, and these are being discussed and disputed by members of the public, including a group of uh, activists who work closely with the fisher community in Chennai and who were debating some of the measurements of the canals that were being um, presented um, as the kind of official line between land and water. So this brings me to the archive. So kind of informed by this sort of uh, interplay between hydro uh, nostalgia and hydrocolonialism, as well as this kind of struggle over the demarcation of land and water, um, I entered this large archive of historical maps that I was able to source from a variety of collections, which I then, with the help of uh, Marcel Fortin, began to um, place on a GIS um, 
um, infrastructure, energy as platform we were using, reusing ArcGIS. Um, so I've become quite interested in what maps can do when they are in fact digitized and um, uh, digitalized. Um, for one thing, in my research with my collaborators, I uh, noticed that digital maps, in fact, just putting a map on a screen uh, allows people from a particular area to reconnect that map to landscape affect and imagination in all kinds of novel and interesting ways. It allowed for a lot of non-linear play between memory, um, kind of being confronted by an a, a spatial uh, cartography, kind of maybe different from what they had noted. Uh, it allowed for a degree of bilingual conversation. And most importantly, it countered the dispersal of data and space, which is the reality of urbanism today, to enable new engagements. So this was, this was what I kind of thought was really interesting about it. But the GIS, um, putting maps on the GIS also um, cre uh, you know, posed lots of questions um, for many, many of which I don't really have a very um, good answers. I'm still learning from the process. Um, the first question is, you know, what is a sustainable digital history project? Um, the second is, you know, what is a truly collaborative GIS project? And Marcel and I have been talking endlessly about this. Um, third is how can we make whatever we do at the end of this research, um, my collaborators and I, how can we make it accessible on a 4G network? Um, how, how might we make it accessible on screens such as a phone, a small smartphone? Third, what does it mean to create open and linked data sets on this kind of platform? Um, and uh, fifthly, how can wetness and kind of the three dimensionality of a sort of a seasonal, seasonally inflected water landscape be actually visualized digitally? So these were all kind of problems that, um, you know, my project is trying to deal with. Um, and in special, I, I want to also sort of share a slide where I kind of lay out actually also the problem with the data sets. Um, in my kind of initial uh, exploration of DH protocols um, and the kind of, uh, I suppose the, um, uh, the call to make data sets um, open and transparent and easily downloadable, um, I began to then try to see what we might do uh, in the project by way of um, putting our information, our maps online. So the first problem we encountered from the ground was this question of misuse. How much should be online when many of the precariously um, employed and precariously living people were so subject to court orders concerning eviction and resettlement, putting locality maps online could actually make them more, more vulnerable. The second was what was proprietal data versus open data. Um, it was entirely unclear for me, and until recently, I think, uh, for us to be able to use Survey of India data online, because they were seeing it, it was either a gray area of intellectual property or subject to copyright. It wasn't very clear. Um, and so um, I felt like um, I had to really kind of think through this problem of who owns this data. Um, and then the third or the fourth question was really the attribute table of the GIS um, platform itself, which, you know, when you click on it, uh, basically gives you kind of the basic uh, measurements and uh, classifications concerning, say, a water body or a geographical feature. Um, and uh, obviously, I realized right then and there, uh, the challenges that kind of geographic classification poses to both, uh, say, how, say, Fisher communities describe the meeting of the land and the sea, um, the estuary and the and the sea, for example, uh, or uh, you know rain rain fed lakes, which kind of um, really can be visible only in certain parts of the year and look like dry land on the other. So this question of seasonality, the ways in which uh, say Tamil words are used to describe certain kinds of landscapes have all posed uh, quite a challenge to me in terms of how to organize um, attribute tables. And then the final uh, question that come, came to me with open, um, creating an open data set was how do you kind of create a set that is um, credible and that maintains it, its, its integrity and cannot be uh, circulated or edited in ways that would kind of vitiate um, some of the thinking um, that's gone into the data set. So what are my methods? I would say I kind of this like uh, presentation was an occasion for me to think about what we're actually doing to kind of address some of these challenges. The first is I'm just calling it artisanal approach just to distinguish 
this project from kind of larger machine learning AI oriented projects. Um, we are in, engaged in what is really a labor intensive process of drawing water features. Um, we are trying to, through that process and through a very careful understanding of the attribute tables, um, try and uh, understand questions of intertidality, sewage, drainage, groundwater reliance, and kind of weld that or mesh that with qualitative uh, research. The second is um, we're trying to create ways of scaffolding towards shareable data. So rather than say this data is going to be forever secret and behind, uh, you know, locked or completely unlocked, we are trying to uh, create collaborative writing experiments and other ways of seeding some of this material in such a way that um, when this material goes online, um, it will already have some kind of academic and kind of audience interest um, in, in the data set so that it can be used um, in, in a way uh, that might hopefully um, be more sustainable and you know, may be more robust um, in, the, in the kind of medium and uh, long term. Uh, but I think the third point, the uh, point C, um, which I feel like uh, I'm only now realizing is that I feel like there is a sort of need for map literacy uh, especially in our digital age. And uh, we haven't quite addressed it, but I think my group is kind of realizing that even before talking about Chennai, we'd have to sort of frame our projects broadly in terms of, you know, what does it mean to see water? What does it mean to visualize water? So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bhavani. That was wonderful. Um, we are going to have Marcel speaking next. Okay, I'll assume that my screen is uh, being shared properly. Yes. Okay, um, well, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, this is a project that's uh, uh, been a long uh, journey. Uh, it's, been, it, it's been really interesting, especially uh, in thinking about it um, for this presentation and the way you presented, the, you introduced the, the, the day uh, or the, the, the session, Elisa. Is is really thinking about, um, uh, you know, as you are looking at land, especially if you're looking at all of Ontario, all of Southern Ontario, with this project, and the project being so long, is you, you it's hard sometimes to look at it differently, and it, I think that's something that's uh, that that's happening now, and. Uh, it's hard though, and I, I'll get into this a little bit later, it's hard to then look at it differently and to add new things to it. And I'll, I'll go into that a bit more. But uh, just that the thinking about land in different ways is extremely important. This project started a long time ago, as I mentioned. Um, the precursor to it was uh, something that came out in about 1999 or 2000 at McGill University. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention that I've got uh, two colleagues that I've worked with for a very long time, Cheryl Woods and Lorraine DeBury, who um, have both retired. That's how long uh, we've been working on this project since the early 2000s. So uh, it's important to note that their, their contribution of, of this. Uh, Lorraine had started this project at McGill, and it's actually still online and works, and it was not a GIS per se. Uh, but it tried to do uh, uh, web mapping in a really interesting way. And it's fantastic that it's still up and running. Uh, but it, it, it's important to note though that Ontario County atlases and county maps are actually two different things. The atlases actually are later, they come later than the maps and the atlases uh, don't have as much information on them. Uh, this is, these are just a couple of screen captures of the County Atlas project here where you can actually search names and find where they are on specific maps. And, and really still quite impressive that they still work. County maps and atlases for that matter were both um, 19th century American inventions uh, that started in the wet, on the west of the east coast of the United States and then slowly made their way into Ontario and the, and the rest of Canada. And there were a total of 54 county maps in Canada, 32 in Ontario, and five counties in Ontario actually were revised. We don't have all the maps. We're still looking for some maps. Um, there are some areas that were obviously not done. You can see that the Peterborough area was not done, uh, but most of Southern Ontario was done. And the mapping, uh, to get into the mapping, the, the, and, and the project, the really big challenge, especially at the beginning, 
um, and we've and now we we've we've had to revise our methods. Is how do you scan these very brittle, massive maps? You can see the size of these here: 100, 138 centimeters by 169, that don't go through a scanner because they are so brittle. So we've had to take photographs of them, um, and I've got to zoom in. And photographs of them uh, like this at very high resolution, and that part was great, but the 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 putting them back together is really not something that you can do in terms of flattening them out and then georeferencing them. So the important thing about county maps is that um, they were they were commercial enterprises. Uh, they were sold to subscribers. But most important to us, though, is that they contain land ownership and land occupancy information. And so the names of land occupants are actually on the maps. Even if it a commercial body owns the land, the, the commercial uh, name is on the actual map. So there's there's hundreds of thousands of names across uh, all these county maps. So this is um, the reconstruction through georeferencing of a map. And th this is again, a screenshot for a from a very long time ago, but the concept is the same. Georeference these images to put them in a GIS. Um, and then once that's done to then geographically create or create a, a feature layer that has the names of all the occupants. So that was the number one thing. And, it, and it's a really simple concept, but how do you then deal with hundreds of thousands of names and uh, very high resolution imagery, uh, especially in the two, early 2000s, we went through lots of different uh, attempts at putting these online without very much success. So we, we, it's a good thing that the project took a long time because we've been able to uh, do some really interesting things since then. So this is what uh, the desktop GIS looked like when we were doing this in just a GIS. Uh, the maps would be georeferenced and then we would add the names one by one, adding the uh, lot and concession, county and township information. Um, but slowly with web mapping, the way it has become, ArcGIS Online has become our, our, our part of, not just our, our method of publishing, but it's actually become part of our actual GIS creation. We no longer create anything on the desktop. We create everything online, except for the georeferencing of the images that still has to happen in desktop. Uh, so this is a, a screen capture of the actual database online that can be um, viewed by clicking on different names, uh, but also searched. So you can see, you can search here, um, uh, all the Smiths that are in Southern Ontario, um, and uh, you can search by all townships or, uh, or just a specific township to have all the names appear or an, an entire county for all the names to appear. Uh, so there are lots of different ways of being able to search. This is an incredibly powerful way of doing things compared to the early 2000s. So it's, it's been a real godsend to have ArcGIS online. So again, this is what um, a search and then uh, you click on the list, uh, an item on a list and it zooms you to that specific location. Um, other fun things that we're able to do with ArcGIS online is those scanned maps is to do things like, you know, show how you can uh, look at what's underneath the map. So this is the high park in Toronto. <laughs> Um, now, one of the things that happened uh, as well is with ArcGIS Online, you can actually easily build crowdsourcing apps. And during the pandemic, we were just about to enroll this when um, a, a few members of the public actually a, a, uh, approached us about counties that they knew existed, but weren't on our project yet. So we built a separate app that actually allowed them to enter the, the, uh, the data without even using the GIS side of things, but simply adding the data in here. So um, impressively, uh, there are not that many errors. We've gone through and fixed some errors, but um, we had one person do all of Exeter County and that was the big, uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, real uh, show that, uh, demonstration that this could actually be done. And then with some of the staff at U of T libraries that um, needed other things to do while working from home, we added some people to the project as well and added, um, trained them on how to use the app. And um, it's as simple as going to the website, clicking on a name, adding the name, concession, um, concession to, uh, township name, uh, the lot, and just simply moving on. So we went from, two, from 2003 to 2019, 
having 100,000 names to then adding 57,000 more in just one year or just over a year, March 2020 to November 2021, 57,000 names. So you can see the power of that. And yes, there might be some errors, but there's nothing like getting it done and then finish the names in the next uh, few years. Uh, but it's also looking at changes in, uh, in uh, the, the, the land as well, um, looking at lost streams, lost lakes, um, looking at also some of the other information that's on these maps, things like uh, temperance halls, churches, post offices, and so on. Um, linking to the census as well would be uh, something that we could do, but th that's a really, really difficult one to do. But there might be ways of programmatically doing this. Once we, we're finished with the names, we're definitely going to explore, uh, explore this area. And as, you, as we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, when you build a project like this, you have a very, focus, a very specific focus of, for us, it was putting the names of these people so that they could be searched and possibly link them to the census. But when you start when we start looking at the possibilities of, of what else could be done and looking at mapping in a, in a very sort of colonial eye and looking at what we're now really, uh, really um, striving for with truth and reconciliation is adding the indigenous voice. And, and to do that is uh, going to be really exciting, but how to do that will also require us to to um, talk to some people and 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 bring in uh, people who can help us, you know, add these these absences of, of indigenous voices, adding place names, for instance, place names that have changed, um, uh, sort of putting the, the colonialism within context. Um, other smaller issues as well, um, language issues. There are so many names that are not spelled properly as well, especially uh, German names. Um, French names in a lot of the areas. Uh, the Essex area, for instance, had a lot of Francophones and then the Ottawa area as well. And all the names or many, many of the names were anglicized for the maps as well. So putting those things into context as well, I think are gonna be really important with this project. And with that, that's uh, where I'm going to end. Thanks very much, Marcel. That was fascinating. Um, Tia, you are up. Thank you uh, very much. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Okay, um, so thank you very much to Elisa and Danielle and the rest of the CDHI team for organizing this lightning lunch uh, and for encouraging us to sort of have a discussion about spatial research at um, U of T in this collaborative forum. So just to introduce myself, my name is Tia Sager. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at U of T, and I'm completing my dissertation currently under the supervision of Professor Carl Knappett. My research interests lie in the ancient architecture and spatial analysis, and my current research is focused on the architecture of the Bronze Age Aegean, specifically the island of Crete during the Late Bronze Age. My dissertation project combines several spatial methodologies, namely space syntax analysis, 3D scanning and 3D modeling, along with more traditional architectural methods and phenomenological approaches in order to address questions about the architecture of this period on Crete. So um, this is just a little uh, map, very traditional uh, non-digital map to show you um, the Aegean, uh, the area that I work on um, in the Mediterranean, and then the island of Crete and where it is located. So my current research um, started really um, in my undergraduate uh, degree. I became interested in spatial analysis when I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Kevin Fisher at the University of British Columbia. Um, Dr. Fisher was and still is part of an ongoing project on the island of Cyprus, um, the Calavasos and Moroni Built Environments Project or CAMBE for short. And during a term as his research assistant, I had the opportunity to learn about space syntax analysis and to use it in order to study a few Bronze Age Cypriot built environments, as well as to first try my hand at basic 3D modeling in SketchUp, the results of which you can see here. So this was sort of a basic um, 3D model um, that we came up with of the so-called Ashlar building at Enkomi on the island of Cyprus. This, um, and, and you can see now sort of the more current results of this project, um, which is very exciting and I recommend that you check out on the UBC website. 
So this got me interested in the potential of spatial analysis for Bronze Age architecture, and I subsequently had the chance to work with Dr. Quentin Le Tesson from the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, who is an expert on space syntax analysis in Bronze Age Crete. In his dissertation, Le Tesson combined this approach of space syntax analysis with more qualitative approaches, um, particularly phenomenology, that would account for the human dimension of the built environment. Um, and he did this in order to balance the arguably more structural nature of space syntax analysis, which is predominantly quantitative, but also qualitative in some ways, um, with sort of phenomenological approaches. So you can see here his um, doctoral thesis, Du Phenotype au Genotype, and um, an excerpt from an article um, he wrote more recently, showing you sort of the plan-based focus of space syntax analysis um, that then turns these plans, these architectural plans, into sort of graphs as they are shown below based on depth and configuration. So space syntax is a methodology that was originally developed at University College London by Bill Hillier and Julian Hansen in the 1980s, culminating in the seminal works titled The Social Logic of Space from 1984 and Space is the Machine, a Configurational Theory of Architecture from 1996. Space syntax can be defined, as is written on the um, official space syntax website at UCL, as a set of techniques for analyzing spatial layouts and human activity patterns in buildings and urban areas. It is also a set of theories linking space and society. Space syntax addresses where people are, how they move, how they adapt, how they develop, and how they talk about space. So, um, this is just sort of an example of how these uh, very flat uh, 2D building plans um, can be turned into graphs in order to analyze the depth of certain spaces, um, starting from the outside and then going in um, each sort of step along the way into the depth of a building. So to summarize, this is a methodology which effectively allows one to read a building um, by turning a plan into a readable graph based on spatial depth, location, and configuration. The the results of which are a number of qualitative graphs in addition to quantitative calculations that can be compared across a large sample of built environments. When used as a comparative macro scale approach, space syntax analysis can tell us about the ways in which spatial configuration might have been locally or even regionally generated, which is quite exciting. This approach is useful because it can be used to track incremental changes in configuration of space over time during various occupational periods of a building, for example, though it has often not been used in this way. In conducting my own study of late Bronze Age built environments on Crete, however, I became aware of the huge potential of the space syntax approach um, for the macro or island-wide scale of the island of Crete, but also inevitably its limitations. In privileging the architectural floor plan, as you can see here, space syntax analysis has historically focused predominantly on static single phase building plans. Um, so how can we shift the focus to a built environment's history over time, rather than focusing on a single static plan, either its first or final iteration, and treat the building built environment as a living entity rather than a static one. Also, how do we reincorporate the human dimension um, into, uh, into such, a, such a study? Um, and I started to understand why other scholars um, that had heavily influenced my work were incorporating other methods such as 3D modeling and phenomenological approaches in order to sort of balance out space syntax analysis. So in my dissertation, I am trying to incorporate multi-phase plans, um, and here you can see um, four phases of a single built environment on Crete. Um, and in previous studies, this approach hasn't really been taken. It's usually been sort of the final phase that has been the focus of most studies. Um, and I want to do this in order to account for change in spatial configuration over time, as you can see demonstrated here quite uh, dramatically in these graphs, um, how configuration changes through simple things such as door blocking, which is highlighted here in red on these plans. Um, so as part of my thesis um, research and data collection, I was able to travel to Crete in September to visit and photograph a number of sites. And um, I decided to incorporate phenomenology into my approach in order to look at sort of the human dimension in these built environments. 
I documented my own experiences of moving through sites and individual buildings. However, I realized that notes and static images, again, uh, sort of compressed the built environment yet again into this 2D uh, image, and they would not be the most effective at conveying lived experience. To aid with this approach, um, when I was back in Toronto, I relied on digital approaches such as 3D scanning, an example of which you can see here um, as a 3D scan of House X at Comos, a site on Crete. And uh, I took a number of these 3D scans, um, which allow you to have sort of a, a model that you can um, manipulate in three dimensions, which I will eventually transform into active 3D models, um, thanks to the support of the Critical Digital Humanities Graduate Fellowship. This project is still in its early stages, but the goal will be to include different phases of occupation and assemblages of objects, both things that are rarely included in most digital 3D reconstructions. Um, in addition, I wish to use this methodology as a heuristic device in order to rebuild particularly important or contentious built environments uh, stone by stone, followed by adding um, features such as plaster um, in order to better understand the process of construction myself in a sort of phenomenological way, um, which is very difficult to do when only reading about it or looking at 2D um, images. So in, uh, in doing this process, my goal is to focus on the micro scale of the built environment and to allow single buildings to tell a story, moving away from grand narratives and offering sort of a balance to the large scale comparative studies um, that have been conducted previously by means of approaches such as space syntax analysis. So I hope to focus on individual built environments and consider criteria such as construction techniques and gradual functional changes over time. Um, and to look at the impact and influence of architectural, um, architectural influ influence from other sites um, into Crete as well. Um, so just to give you sort of um, an example of the potential of combining space syntax analysis, a more quantitative approach um, with 3D modeling. Um, this is just an example of how 3D scanning, which you can see here on the left, can be combined with 3D modeling, um, where modeled stones can be added to fill in um, natural gaps that always occur sort of in the 3D scanning process. And even you can see um, stones added here um, to start the reconstruction of um, what is an ancient wall, um, just the foundations of an ancient wall that we have here. Um, and my goal eventually is to create something quite alive and living, um, as you can see in an example here from uh, Criterion Thera, um, modern day Santorini. Um, so something that shows uh, what the building could have looked like in its inception. Um, and I would like to do that by really rebuilding um, certain features stone by stone, um, creating walls, replastering them, um, and then adding um, various um, features that were found and objects that were found in these buildings. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm surely out of time. <laughs> thank you, Tia. That was um, really wonderful. I'm going to um, pin the four of us. OK, let's get Bonnie in here and Marcel. Okay, great. So um, we are opening up the questions to the audience. If anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute yourself and feel free to join the conversation. Um, you can keep your video off or you can keep it on, um, your choice. Um, okay, so maybe we can start by um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about is uh, the challenges with mapping, um, mapping the past and the present. So how do you deal with um, imposing modern mapping paradigms um, onto the past? So I was wondering if each of you could uh, say something about that. I, I can start if you want. Sure. Um, well, uh, certainly there are technical issues that, that come into play. Uh, for instance, the maps that I'm looking at um, from the 19th century didn't have a projection. Um, and since they cover, in some cases, lots of territory, um, you can't help but uh, distort the past in many ways. And the maps were never intended to be looked at this way. Um, and um, I think that's the number one thing that I would say is the difficulties we've had 
are based on on why on on the on the past view of how maps were used. So mm -hmm. these are just not done the same as if they had been built digitally. Um, and and I think that that yeah I, um, yeah I'll I'll leave it at that. Definitely that that is a, a big big issue in terms of of the technical side the projection. Uh, lack of projection information um, leads you to do things very that were not meant to be in some ways. Maybe I can uh, uh, say a little bit from my project and also my previous research, which is that colonial cartographic conventions, um, not surprisingly, and you know I was looking at Marcel's um, database as well, privilege property, right, and individual. Um, certain people who are on top of the hierarchy. So in the context of colonial Madras, um, it was European owners of property who were often um, figured on the, on the maps. Um, but, the, but the problem is broader than that in the sense that if you have an entire setup that is focused on demarcating land and property as its main objective, um, I feel like I've had to really think about um, not just cartographic conventions, but also kind of the legal um, um, centrality of property management uh, in the governance of space and the challenges it poses to both communities which have precarious or who are rendered precarious as a result of those property claims, but also in terms of actually uh, thinking about flood risk and you know uh, sea level rise mitigation in a city like Chennai. Mm -hmm. So it's also because a lot of the municipal infrastructure focuses on uh, the protection of property. A lot of insurance mapping focuses on the protection of property. So it's it's so it's both about I think talking about how maps lie, but also I think on making this whole um, infra you know epistemology around around property. Um, if I can just add. Um... I think as, as everyone has mentioned, it's really important to, um, especially uh, when looking at a period, perhaps um, I look at a prehistoric period for which we have no written documentation. So it is very much, um, it's been called sort of inventing the past. Um, what we've done, uh, you know, over the over the various um, centuries of archaeology as a discipline. So I think it's really important to acknowledge bias um, when creating these maps and incorporate historiography um, into the project, as I think everyone is sort of uh, doing. It's such an essential part of looking at how even previous studies have been conducted, what kind of plans we're working from and basing um, our future work on. And then um, I guess the only way um, that I've found so far to really move away from um, giving a single approach um, hegemony is to, to combine methodologies and to consider perhaps, you know, variations and be okay with saying, you know, this is just my vision of, of how um, this 3D model, as an example, looks like. Um, but here are several perhaps different options. And of course, that takes a lot of time and collaborative work. But hopefully in doing this kind of thing and, and providing different options, we can say, this is what we know of the past. And this is, um, you know, how, how um, our different versions of the past can coexist at once, since there are, you know, mm -hmm. multiple versions for sure. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Marcel. Oh, I was just going to say that I think that's a really important point uh, is, is looking at where these maps came from or, or where our views come from and, and the biases. And, and for my maps, the, the, the mere fact that they were commercial items tells you something. Uh, it's not something I've delved into too much. There, is, there hasn't been a whole lot of research from that standpoint, but there's plenty to be said of those commercial bodies. And the, the, the link between commercial body and the government that actually created this survey, right? The, 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 these were based on a survey that was done by government and why was the government surveying the land and, and how they surveyed it is also a, a huge bias. Um, and, and the differences in the different places and the, uh, somebody uh, put a, a question uh, about how do you map the same place twice? You know, there, there are several of the counties that have been remapped and several of the counties have actually disappeared and then appeared in something else. So lots of different biases that can happen and things happen for a reason. And, and to be able to delve into that as part of your project is sometimes hard, but it's something that 
that you know hopefully somebody that will take some of my data and will be able to do that in the future mm -hmm. we have a few questions in the chat from kathy chung and um so bavani she asks you how much documentary evidence can you get of how indigenous peoples understood geographic features in their environment um, so, for instance, are there maps drawn by Indigenous people available? And uh, Kathy also turns the question to you, Marcel. Um, uh, so might a future project be to find historical maps created by Indigenous peoples? Um, okay, so maybe I should frame my response by saying that the term Indigenous has a slightly different provenance um, mm -hmm. in the field and area I work in. And I think having a conversation about the question of indigeneity within the kind of British Empire in the Indian context and in the settler colonial context in the Canada, that conversation still needs to be staged. And there are many, many, many important issues there. So I'm going to bracket that for a second and say that from the 18th, so Chennai is a colonial city in the sense it was established by the British. And so it's on the one hand very thickly mapped compared to many other areas of the subcontinent, but um, these are very much, as I just explained, um, uh, mapped in a, in a, in, with a particular vision in mind. Having said that, the Mughal Empire, um, other imperial formations also produce maps um, of cities. And there are some very interesting studies that have been done of early, mo early modern cartography in South Asia, uh, but not of this particular site, because this is, as I said, a British uh, territorially uh, established site. Um, so that's, so it's been kind of interesting to kind of read on, you know, various um, Maratha, British, uh, Mughal, sorry, other mapping entities in relationship to this project. Um, in terms of the practical question of then, how do you think about hydro management um, in this context? And is there a sort of, what what I think people in my field would call pre-colonial, even though that's a fairly, you know, it's a strange way to call things, I suppose, um, is um, there are certain, and there are very dense um, epigraphic and other data bases that one can use to understand how, um, you know, landscape was configured and managed, um, especially hydrological landscape. So there is a wealth of material there but those would have to be you know, worked on with archeologists and I think um, folks who are um, you know, uh, trained in epigraphy for us to be able to map them with any, um, with any confidence. Um, sorry, I should also add that um, there are of course very important vernacular understandings of spatial mapping that are available um, that, you know, for example, some of the groups that uh, the environmental justice NGO that I work with, uh, the Fisher groups also kind of mobilize in, in law courts and things like that, which are uh, extremely important, but kind of get filed under kind of customary practice. But those are also in a way maps, uh, if you want to think mm -hmm. about that, that way maps of, of, of sharing water or, or land. Marcel, do you see um, historic maps uh, created by Indigenous peoples in Ontario? Um, it's something that uh, I wish existed, but it's not something that you can uncover. And I think the, the next best thing, and, and, and that goes to show again that, that aspect of colonialism that, that one person's maps, you know, one powerful map system completely overshadows another. It's not that they didn't never existed. It's that the, the system that they were used in and, and the methods that were that were used are just completely overshadowed and are lost to this today. Um, I think what's important instead is, and, and one of the other projects that I'm working on right now is that what we have uncovered though is the memory, uh, the collective memory and in sometimes very specific personal memory of uh, um, areas that are were used for hunting areas that were used uh, sort of these artificial borders that that uh, overlapped each other and we're finding that those can be done and and um, a black creek black creek pioneer village project that i'm working on right now uh, we've got one map that we're working on where it's current people thinking about the past and and so it's their interpretation of the land not necessarily as it would have been mapped and i think that's how we see it now but I think that Indigenous people might think of it differently is that it doesn't, it doesn't need to necessarily have been mapped then to be worthwhile, but it can still be mapped now. 
and be incorporated into how we view the land. So I think that's an important part is you, you, you can go out looking for maps, but what would they show you anyway? So I think it's better to think of it in a, in a different way now. Yeah, I think you've all touched on um, something about the construction of data and um, the biases that data has. And Tia, I love your suggestion of offering options and that just like inherently that demonstrates that data is the construction, right? Because you're showing there are many ways in which it can be presented. I also love your phrase, the compression of data. Um, so you're all sort of like using maps to talk about phenomenology and affect and things that are more human than just a map. Um, so I was wondering if you can say a little bit more about how you can draw out those human connections or those effective aspects um, through your mapping. Um, I can say a little bit. I, I just just to say that uh, I think the GIS infrastructure is two dimensional in its orientation, and there you do have a significant challenge to you know, other ways of mapping. And so I love looking at Tia's modeling because I think that that's kind of one way by which we could, you know, start reconceiving uh, space. And I think certainly the kind of spatial diagrams and I guess the space index is one vector through which one can create those flow charts and so on. Um, there might be other ways of visualizing um, uh, architecture, which, you know, so for me, I was thinking, you know, what does it mean to walk on the beach with a fisher elder and how would it look like? Would it be possible to create an alternative atlas? Um, I don't know. I don't know how much the GIS um, might help us do that, but it might be possible to incorporate insights from GIS into something else would be kind of my stance at this point. Um, I think it, it's really important, as Tia said, to to look at as many as many ways of, of looking at things as you can. Uh, I always teach students to not just look at one map and, and draw conclusions from from something, but to look at many maps. And I think that's a huge problem that we've got now is that while we've got all these maps at our fingertips, we look at what's the truth, though, and go to Google Maps for our truth. And it's so, again, just a commercial enterprise and it's very useful, but oh, use OpenStreetMap as well. Use other mapping tools, learn how to map yourself and just look at COVID mapping statistics. They're so useless in so, in so many maps. You, you map Canada, uh, COVID statistics, and they mean nothing at the level that we're mapping them at. And, but at the, map, at the levels that we need them to be mapped at, the data can't be accessed. So we also have to look at, at alternatives. And, and, and again, the, the crowdsourcing um, method really showed me that you can get a lot of things done and you can really, um, yeah, if, if, we, if we find alternative uh, sources of, of data and alter, alter, alternative methods of doing things. Um, I think it's, um, I was so inspired by your mapping projects and uh, it reminded me of a, a talk at the recent um, Digital Humanities Conference where someone talked about the politics of, um, of mapping and, and sort of, you know, who's omitted from maps and even a current geopolitics, um, which I found really fascinating. Uh, not something I really work on, but it's amazing to think about how Google Maps um, specifically today um, still sort of emits certain neighborhoods or the names are not, um, you know, uh, the traditional names for a certain place and, and things are changed and adapted. And even um, just as an example, when I was in Crete a, a month ago, um, the different layers in Google Maps were really, I've never used um, and switched between layers as much as I did in that moment because um, there are so few <laughs> streets, you know, when you go to rural places that are that will be visible on the regular sort of um, flat um, 2D map. And then when you add the terrain, then you see, oh my gosh, what, what says, you know, two kilometers um, by, by sort of bird's eye view is actually going to take an hour because it's uphill on a serpentine road along a mountain. And this is completely invisible in, in sort of the flatness of the map. And I wonder um, what the potential is um, for sort of this layering 
approach in maps and and adding even that geosourcing um, uh, or, or um, crowdsourcing um, layer and, and textual evidence and even photographs. Um, I wonder if this if this is something that, that could be done. I mean, it's really exciting, I think, if, um, for all of our work. So. Yeah, you're all talking about really complex data and um, like 3D data that is compressed or flattened in a lot of different ways. I guess I'm wondering, um, is this, is at the heart of this an issue of linked data, um, the problem of linking data between projects and how projects can speak to each other? Um, Bhavani, you had talked about the problem of collaboration and how do we get that information across, not just within a project, many people within a project, but project speaking to each other. Um, how, how can we move forward with uh, those issues in mind? Bhavani, maybe I can speak a little bit in terms of the difficulties we've encountered, right? Again, Esri, while it's worked well for my work, I wish I could get away from it in some ways, right? Because some things should be simple. For instance, we pay for an Esri license. Um, the University of, I forget, Bhavani, the, the, your colleague in Britain that we tried to connect to, you know, the, just the fact that these two systems are the same does not mean they speak to each other. And, and again, it's a commercial reason why they don't, but we're not really entirely sure what that reason is, but uh, the, the, just the difficulty of doing that. And so imagine when things aren't on, uh, on a, if, a, if a free system tries to work with a commercial system, just look at trying to, you know, download music on your, on your iPhone or your, your Apple watch that's not Apple music. It, it, I think the, the, the technology is there. I think there needs to be a lot of willingness to be able to do that. And right now, trying to, trying to you know, connect, um, let's say, an, an open street map system to ArcGIS Online, you could maybe see the, the, the base map, uh, but really, are you really able to truly take advantage of that open system? Not really. Uh, so I think there's a lot of a lot of, um, I think that open source systems will help, but they're not the full solution. I think mapping will always be hard. That's um, much easier now, but then once you get into developing a project and have, you then hit another barrier every time. And I think that's why we're here, right? If it was all simple, we wouldn't be bothering talking about it at a lunchtime talk. But yeah, there are lots of challenges still between systems talking to each other and just finishing a project is hard enough to then link to the census for my project, for instance, is really going to be difficult. But yes, linked data, it sounds good. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, um, at least from the Indian context, which is the stuff that I'm delving in, there are many, many issues. I mean, uh, partly as Marcel said, at the research researcher level, um, a lot of these GIS systems, um, especially ArcGIS, are not set up for collaborative work except within your own corporate institution, in which case it's the U of T. So anything that is inter-institutional or anything that envisages active collaboration for non-institutional members becomes like a massive headache. Um, I did experiment with QGIS and you know, Marcel and I had a lot of back and forth about that because a lot of my collaborators do work with Q QGIS. But it doesn't necessarily lend itself to a um, sustainable online archiving of the material. So it's possible to kind of say set up a research group that works largely offline on QGIS. But the end, at the end of the day, you need to have some sort of base where the metadata can be included, which can be cataloged, which can sustain itself over a period of time. So that was the second sort of related challenge. And then the third thing is that a lot of um, uh, information, firstly, the databases, are they reliable? You know, how do you link them up? So in addition to the technological issues, you know, would you want this to kind of mirror the epistemological assumptions of those other data sets? Um, these are all things that one has to sort of think through a little bit. Uh, and it makes me less, um, shall we say, uh, uh, attribute an emancipatory sort of, you know, tone to open and link data sets than I might have previously done. Um, we are about 10 past one, so I want to throw it out there. If anyone has any last question that they want to ask, um, now is the time to do it. <laughs> um, 
otherwise, I will just say thank you all for coming to our second lightning lunch of um, this academic year. Our third lightning lunch will pick up a lot of the discussion that we've been having today. It is on December 7th uh, from 12 to 1 again on Zoom, and it will be featuring three of our inaugural CDHI grad fellows. We'll be talking about ethical DH, and we'll be discussing um, how to engage in ethical and culturally sensitive digital humanities work. So we've popped the registration link in the chat. Um, we've also put in the chat um, the registration sign up for Story Maps workshop, which is happening next week and is run by Marcel, who gave a wonderful presentation today. And we'd also ask you to please fill out our feedback form, um, which we've also popped in the chat. Uh, we'd welcome any feedback you have so that we can make sure to deliver uh, better lightning lunches in the future. So thank you again all for coming. We'll send out um, a YouTube link to the presentation today. Um, and please feel free to follow us on Twitter or add to our conversation with the hashtag CDHI Talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks. Thanks.